Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we are going to be examining the many different measures of development. As countries become more developed, many different things change. So tonight, we're going to examine some of those changes. Now, many of these concepts will be reviewed from earlier in the year, but tonight, we're going to go into greater depth and detail. So let's begin by reviewing the different sectors of the economy. The primary sector is the portion of the economy concerned with the direct extraction of materials from Earth's surface, generally through agriculture, although sometimes by mining, fishing, and forestry. The secondary sector is the portion of the economy concerned with manufacturing useful products through processing, transforming, and assembling those raw materials of the primary sector. And the tertiary sector is the portion of the economy concerned with transportation, communications, and utilities, sometimes extended to the provision of all goods and services to people in exchange for payment. But in recent years, as economies have grown more sophisticated, more defined sections of the tertiary sector have emerged, each with unique functions. They are known as the quaternary and quinary sectors. The quaternary sector is the service sector industries concerned with the collection, processing, and manipulation of information and capital. Examples include finance, administration, insurance, and legal services. This sector is dominated by intellectual and informational services that tend to require higher levels of education. So computer software developers, doctors, and lawyers would be part of this sector. The quinary sector is the service sector industries that require a high level of specialized knowledge or technical skill. Examples include scientific research, or high level management. The top leaders in government, science, universities, and business would be included in this service sector. These leaders make high level decisions on investments, research, and product development that affect huge numbers of people. So we're discussing this now because the structure of a country's economy can reveal much about its level of development. In less developed countries, countries that are part of the periphery, like Nepal, the primary sector is dominant. Many people work in agriculture, specifically subsistence farming. As countries industrialize, the secondary sector employment increases. So semi-periphery countries see increasing employment in manufacturing. Brazil has a much higher secondary sector employment rate than Nepal. Core countries are dominated by the tertiary sector. In part, this is because the secondary sector employment has declined due to automation. So countries like the United States, Japan, Australia, and Singapore have very low primary sector employment and relatively low secondary sector employment as the share of service sector jobs, especially quaternary and quinary jobs, increase. But a diversified economy means that a country has a balance between all three sectors and that can contribute to improving levels of development. So let's continue our conversation by examining some other economic measures of development. These are generally good quantitative metrics to help us understand the quality of life in different places. We'll start with perhaps the most well-known economic indicator of development, and that is gross domestic product, or GDP. This is the total value of goods and services within the borders of a country during a specific time period, usually one year. Generally, as a country's development improves, their GDP increases due to changes in the structure of the economic activities, 
tertiary sector services have more economic value than primary sector raw materials. But businesses and residents' productive activities often occur in more than one country. So we can examine the gross national product, or GNP, which is the total value of all the goods and services produced by a country's citizens and companies, both domestically and internationally, in a year. This reflects a country's real value because it's all the value that flows back to a country, regardless of the location in which it is produced. But the production value versus the real income are two different things, which brings into the conversation gross national income, or GNI. This is the total income of a country's residents and businesses, including investment income, regardless of where it was earned, as well as money received from abroad, such as foreign investment and development aid. So GNI looks at the actual available income, whether that comes from within a country or from foreign direct investment or development assistance. So GNI is a more accurate metric of a country's economy. But this map looks at GNI per capita, which refers to the amount per person. For comparison's sake, let's look at GDP in the top left and GDP per capita in the bottom right. What do you notice when you look at total GDP compared with GDP per person? Write down some of those observations. But there are some criticisms associated with these metrics. And chief among them, at least for us right now, is that these figures only include transactions in the formal economy. The formal economy is the part of the economy that has government supervision, monitoring and protection, and are also taxed. The formal economy is the legal economy that governments tax and monitor. By comparison, the informal economy is any part of a country's economy that is not officially recorded, monitored, regulated, or taxed by the government. So the informal economy includes many different activities from babysitting, being a street vendor, to the illegal drug trade. The informal economy often operates in cash with irregular or uneven income. The workforce is often comprised of people with little education or formal training. It can be in urban or rural areas, but gender discrimination remains an issue as women often make up the largest portion of the informal sector workforce in developing countries. But the fact that it is untaxed means that governments have less revenue to build schools, health clinics, and other social institutions that could improve the quality of life in developing countries. However, the informal economy can be an especially key component of survival in many periphery and semi-periphery countries. But it is important to note that the informal work is not included in GDP, GNP, or GNI statistics for a country. So when a country has a high rate of informal sector employment, their GDP, GNP, or GNI statistics would be incomplete. But informal work can make up as much as 50% of a periphery country's income, and it represents a significant portion of the workforce as evidenced by one-third of India's population being engaged in just three types of informal work. Our final piece of the economic puzzle deals with income distribution. GDP and GNI per capita do not reveal income distribution. 
An uneven distribution might mask very high rates of poverty. Poverty, shown in the top left map, is both an economic and social condition because it affects income as well as other facets of well-being, such as education and health. So the Gini coefficient, shown in the bottom right map, is a measure of income inequality. Again, an average or per person metric of economic development could be misleading if incomes are highly unequal due to high poverty rates. So in general, less developed countries have greater income inequality. And more developed countries, such as those in Western Europe, tend to have lower income inequality. Brazil has a dramatic gap between its wealthiest citizens and the rest of its residents, driven in part because of higher rates of poverty. Shifting away from economic measures of development, now let's look at some social indicators of development. These are some measures of development that change as countries improve from a societal standpoint, rather than just dollars and cents. While core countries have the most diversified economies and the greatest levels of productivity, they also have the highest levels of education and the highest standards of living. Periphery countries, on the other hand, have less diverse economies, which are less productive and generally lower levels of education and lower standards of living. Meanwhile, the semi-periphery countries are improving in some areas, like productivity due to industrialization, with standards of living that fall somewhere between the periphery and the core. But how do we evaluate things like education or standards of living? Those are the social indicators of development. So let's review a lot of social indicators and identify what happens with each of these as countries become more developed. So in your notes, identify if a social measure will increase or decrease as a country improves its development. We'll start with total fertility rate. As countries improve, education, particularly for women, improves, as do sanitation, diet, and access to healthcare. As a result, birth rates broadly and total fertility rates specifically tend to decline as a country improves. The first five years of life are some of the most vulnerable. In fact, in 2017, the youngest age cohort represented the most deaths of any five-year age interval until you get over 75 years of age. So infant and child mortality rates tend to be higher in areas with high poverty and less access to immunizations, medications, antibiotics, and sanitary water. So IMR and CMR tend to be higher in less developed countries, meaning that as countries improve, their IMR and CMR go down. Many things can affect a country's infant mortality rate. Malnutrition and pollution are contributing factors to pneumonia, which is the leading cause of child death. Access to vaccinations, maternal care, prenatal care, expenditures on health care, safe drinking water, sanitation and sewage systems, income inequality, levels of education, particularly for women, the mother's age at a child's birth, among many others, can contribute to a country's infant mortality rate. This is why some geographers believe that IMR is the best social indicator of development. Again, life expectancies tended to increase as countries develop. In fact, in 2015, nearly 70% of the world's countries had a life expectancy above 70 years and 15% of countries have a life expectancy of more than 80 years. Literacy rates are another social indicator because it tends to increase as countries develop. They are generally above 99% in highly developed countries. And according to UNESCO, more than 90% of the world's population in 2015 were literate. 
This means that literacy rates are not likely to differentiate between core and semi-periphery countries, but will generally be the lowest in periphery countries and areas. Even with literacy rates above 90% globally, this still leaves more than 700 million people who are not literate, most of whom are women and most live in rural areas of less developed countries. Access to adequate health care is widely recognized as a general measure of well-being. So as countries develop, their access to health care, specifically doctors per capita and income spent on health care, as well as reproductive, maternal, newborn, and child health, increase. There is a link between economic growth and energy consumption, meaning that as a country's development increases, their energy consumption goes up as well. And since much of the energy consumed now is non-renewable fossil fuels, there's also been an increase in per capita CO2 emissions as well. And finally, gender inequality tends to decline as countries develop. But this will be a topic of conversation in our next lecture. Our final point of conversation tonight regards a summary of economic and social measures of development called the Human Development Index. To review, this is an indicator of the level of development for each country constructed by the United Nations, combining income, education, and life expectancy. This categorizes countries by basic achievement levels, by how much of a country's wealth is directed towards individual human achievement and well-being. The four components of the Human Development Index are GNI per capita, expected years of schooling, measured at the start of school, as well as average years of schooling, measured at age 25, and life expectancy. The rankings of country by human development and income are often similar. Norway ranks first on the Human Development Index and sixth in income. The U.S. ranks 11th in HDI and eighth in income. But policies in individual countries can skew the rankings. For example, countries that invest heavily in education or medical care often rank higher on the index than they do in income. For example, Ireland ranks sixth on the HDI, but only 22nd in income. On the other hand, some countries that are rich in oil or other natural resources rank higher in income than they do on the Human Development Index. Qatar ranks first in the world in income, but only 32nd on the HDI. But there are some criticisms of the Human Development Index as well. It does not address every aspect of human development, such as persistent poverty, environmental quality and sustainability, or overall feelings of security or happiness. And it does not address inequalities among genders, the adherence to different religions or ethnic or linguistic minorities who may not have access to the same opportunities. And we will continue to examine these metrics as we come back to class. Have a good evening, everyone, and we'll see you later.